Hey everyone, this is part two of painting Brock Moon Turned from the Squidmark Kickstarter Champions of Sona. So I hope you enjoyed part one where we painted the owl or most of it. In this one, we're gonna focus on the orc. And as you can see, I've almost finished it. I'm trying to do these videos, you know, once a week and ideally I wanted to finish this orc in one part and I didn't quite get it done. But what I have finished, I think, are the most important parts, which are the skin, which is probably the most important thing, right? Uh, the non-metallic metal and the feathers. Actually, I think the other details, like some leather straps and things like that, are pretty easy and you could probably manage to do those on your own, I'm sure. But in this video, I really wanna focus on the harder parts, like the orc skin and in this alternate color to the normal green we see, and things like non-metallic metal are always pretty tricky. So I really wanna focus on that, but I will briefly take you through the other parts. But yeah, the focus is gonna be on the most important things. It's been a fantastic model to paint the orc. I really like the design, especially the feather headdress, which was quite a lot of work to paint, but it looks really cool. And I always like painting orcs in any color that isn't green. I mean, green's awesome too, but orange is one of my favorite colors. So I think it's really cool that it's the color of the concept art. And I just wanna match that with the painting too. So I started with a black and white prime. So sprayed black or brown and then airbrushed with white. Interestingly, in the end, I really like this for the skin, but not so much for the non-metallic metal. But anyway, let's go over the colors I used. So the orange recipe worked out really, really well. So I really do recommend these colors. The base coat is gonna be Mournfang Brown from GW, something we all know. And yeah, it's just a very orangey brown. So it's kind of perfect for the shadows. I didn't really need to go darker than that either. But the main color is this orange brown, which sounds really boring. It looks boring in the pot, but for some reason, it just works really, really well. It came out super smooth, really matte, and it's all down to this paint, to be honest. So I really recommend it. It's, uh, I don't know, greater than the sum of its parts. It just looks really boring, but it just performs so great. And using this golden uh, brown from AK as well to highlight it, again, was just another gem. So yeah, these two I hadn't used much and they were just fantastic. And Sunny Skin Tone is what I used very sparingly for some little brighter highlights. And this will continue to use to highlighting a lot of the stuff as if there's a sunny light on everything. So a lot of people do a black and white sort of prime, but I think often people are confused how to use it. And here I'm just doing a wash of Mournfang Brown. Well, you could call it a wash or a dilute layer, but this, I am taking advantage of the fact I've got it black and white. I'm just allowing it to flow into the recesses. And of course, the parts where it's left brighter, where the white is, I'm going to highlight them bright anyway. So really, I just want opaque and dark Mournfang Brown where any of those dark bits are. But starting out too thin, I think, is always the way to go. Uh, you can see it's really thin here where I'm putting it on the arm. And I will use Mournfang Brown thicker later but this kind of first ghosting of paint I think is really nice just to do this kind of wash and that means you can do you know the second step with Mournfang Brown again but maybe you'll use a thicker dilution and be more precise where you place those shadows but yeah this is just to get some color on there get some paint to stick and yeah not waste the black and white by obliterating it with uh, some really thick paint basically. Did the same with the fur, just blitzed some burnt umber all over it. I later changed that to some Rhinox hide. But it's the same kind of thing, really. When you've got a grey or a black and white primer, I do like to start off with a bit of a, a thin wash just to find the recesses and kind of allows you to see where you're going, I think. I started working on the non-metallic metal elements and I thought this would save me time in the same way. Essentially, I concluded that I like non-metallic metal gold from black, and that's because it desaturates a lot of the yellow. When you paint yellow over black, it looks kind of greenish, and for me that always helps with the tone to make it feel more like an antique gold 
uh, which is something I prefer as opposed to a really yellowish tone. So I thought this would save me some layers and get a better result, but it's been kind of cool. So the crest on the head I managed to get right with a lot of tweaking of the recipe. Uh, but this part I'm base coating now, the kind of staff, I ended up not liking what I was doing and I did strip the paint and start again. So when we do the tutorial from the non-metallic, I'll show you my first attempts and I changed the recipe halfway through uh, essentially and I did film my second attempt from the ground up with the right recipe on the staff. So even I did a bit of learning on the job and when we come to do the non-metallic, I think I'll go into more detail. I was thinking I was going to go for some heavy verdigris on this and the blue turquoisey colours obviously going to go really nicely with the orange. So I just did a really quick blitz wash of Caribbean blue just as a colour test really to see if I liked it. And of course turquoise and orange, yeah, of course I liked it. So I don't know why I tested it really. But it's quite nice just playing around with really thin washy paints to see uh, what you want from your colour scheme overall. Back to the skin now, and I did do another slightly thicker coat of Mornfang Brown. You can see a lot of the pre-highlight underneath. And now we're going to go in with that orange brown, which is essentially the, the main colour or the mid-tone, but it's definitely the most important uh, colour to use. And here I'm just going to use all the kind of muscles and the where the shadows have formed and just start to sketch out where I think the highlights are going to be and doing that black and white can be really useful in understanding where to start placing this. At this stage you can't go too far wrong because it's so easy to go and add more of that Mornfang brown back in if you feel like you've over highlighted it. But yeah you can see I'm just basically going to paint the orange brown everywhere apart from where the Mornfang brown has really gone into all the recesses and in the strongest shadows. I did do the first coat with a little bit of Mornfang brown mixed in which, yeah, you don't have to do, but I think it helps a little bit. And now I'm just working on the pure orange brown. So this is just a repetition of the previous step, really, just covering a slightly smaller area, but I'm just building up a nice smooth foundation, really. And like I said, this orange brown, it just seems really easy to get a smooth coat with. I felt like I lost a bit of the shadowing on the face, so here you can see I did another wash of Mornfang Brown and this is what I mean it doesn't really matter if you overdo it on the highlight it's really easy to just bring those shadows back. Okay so now I start to mix in that golden brown and it's kind of up to you how many incremental steps you do maybe two or three before you get to pure golden brown I think I did two uh, and it just kind of depends on what sort of paint you are and how much time you want to spend on this but most importantly, I'm putting all the focus and all the highlights really on just one side of the model. Where it sits on the owl, I want there to be a lot of shadows on one side. And that means I'm really putting focus on just highlighting one side of the face and this arm. The rest of the body isn't going to get a lot of highlighting, which looks way cooler and it kind of makes it easier too. So yeah, I'm going to do some yellow highlights on one side of the face. But really I'm going to put all the focus here on his left, our right hand side. As if the light's hitting it, but it can't access the other side of the face. The same with the arm, I start to do smaller and smaller highlights. And I make sure they run all the way up the same position on the arm. It's also important to note that the highlights are going to go right up against some of these shadows in that forearm and that's because the light can kind of access there so just because you have a crease in a muscle doesn't mean a light's not going to be able to hit right next to it and it's important to do that so it feels more natural. We can do quite an exaggerated muscular look with strong shadows but we should still get the placement of the highlights looking fairly realistic I think. Well as realistic as an orc shaman riding a giant owl can be which is not at all. I'm really happy so far and I start to do the highlights with the pure golden brown and to be honest I kind of picked these colours because I was like yeah they look good but man I lucked out they're so nice to work with. You can see as I'm just adding these little highlights onto the forearm they just seem to blend into each other really nicely and they're the perfect level of matte so hey yeah there's not often I'm like definitely get these paints for this recipe. Uh, but yeah, these ones are fantastic. 
you can see I continue with what I said. I'm just putting these highlights on one side of the face and the effect's really starting to uh, work. I base coated the eyes with medium grey and I did the lips and the eyelids with a mix of burnt red which we used for the owl and some Mornfang brown so it kind of matched in with the rest of the skin. Then I did a pupil with some black of course and I did a little white dot which yeah I'm not filming because uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to hold it in focus and get it right but I think you know the drill on that one. Then for the lips, I used that mix of Burnt Red and Mornfang and I just added in my sunny skin tone from here. So it's just kind of skipping some of the mid-tone colours and just adding a touch of that red. So it ties together, but it separates it from the skin enough to feel like the lips. I kept adding sunny skin tone for the highlights on the lips and you just need to push this highlight until it looks nice and shiny uh, and just make sure it matches with the highlights on the face really. Everything on the main viewing angle I wanted to just paint by hand as you've seen but in the shadows and the side you can't really see it when it's glued on the owl so I didn't want to spend forever on this so I did some shading with the airbrush and this just really sped it up in areas that didn't matter as much like the foot at the bottom I don't really want to spend forever on that uh, especially as you're not going to be able to see it too well. So I just used some really diluted Mornfang Brown in the airbrush and managed to just smooth and shade it down in this part. I really wanted it to look, you know, perfect on the face and the arm, so I made sure I didn't use the airbrush on that and just very carefully painted. But certainly using it just on the side really, really helped. Okay, so onto the non-metallic metal part. Really, I'm not going to give you a non-metallic metal lesson because this video is not really about that. But I want to talk to you about the recipe I used and why I had to change it. And also the process. I just struggle to get the contrast I'm used to and also the tones. I think that's down to having the light base coat, which should just work in theory because you can always knock it back, which is kind of what I'm doing here. I'm really putting loads of focus on shadowing one side to match the face but also any areas I know for sure are going to be dark. But this really does affect the tone like I said earlier so when you work from black with yellow colours it does add that greenish kind of tint. It's more difficult to get brighter more saturated colours when going from black but that's actually what I want for my non-metallic metal gold usually a greenish antique kind of look. And yeah, I just found it difficult. You can see here, I started with a base coat of English Uniform and Rhinox Hide. And I'm starting to layer on the English Uniform here. But really, the black and white didn't help in this case. So for the skin, black and white was fantastic. But I think I would probably just start from a plain Rhinox Hide base coat when doing my non-metallic in the future. My usual non-metallic metal recipe is, well, I say usual. But one of my go-to recipes is this one, uh, English Uniform Rhinox Hide, and we've got some Japanese Uniform Pastel Yellow. And it works super, super well. I used this recently for my Elrond tutorial that I filmed for Cut of Paint Patreon, so check out that if you're enjoying these tutorials. And that gold just turned out super, super good. So I was like, right, I'll just use that. It worked really well. But when I went through the process, it just didn't really suit this this model and it was too yellowish which didn't really contrast enough from the skin so I don't think everything has to have a massive contrast but I did think it should be tonally a little greener uh, you know that kind of gold and it'll just fit in nicer with the verdigris I had planned. So I just made a simple switch and instead of using Japanese uniform which is fairly yellow I used this green brown uh, which makes sense when you want a greenish non-metallic gold and you can see it's not too far in the pot but when you use it it's fairly different more desaturated not a lot of yellow in uh, and it just really works and then instead of pastel yellow I'm going to use sunny skin tone uh, which is going to be the universal highlight color throughout this miniature so eventually after getting my dark base coat and changing the recipe I start to add the highlights and you can see here I think it looks really cool 
uh, when you've got like a triangle and one facing is going into the dark and you start to highlight everything that faces the other way. So yeah, having that dark shadow side on the orc face and then doing the same thing on this crest above his head looks really, really cool. And you just have to try and work out what the highlights should look like on each shape, but make sure they come from one direction. The circle bit's really cool as well, where you have a highlight on the top right and then the lower left. And it's kind of makes it easier to make your non-metallics look good when you have interesting shapes like this. The kind of flat crown part across the forehead is a fairly simple cylinder. So I just built up the highlights to be brighter just above the eye. So if the brightest highlight on the crown is above the eye, it's going to draw the attention to where I want, as well as lining up with the highlights on the shoulder and the forearm. And once this all goes together, then it can look really, really cool. The non-metallics were a part I thought, yeah, I just did that Elrond. Uh, I feel warmed up. It's going to be no problem. But yeah, again, I just uh, didn't quite get the recipe right, so it slowed me down. The Verdigris went right first time, and Caribbean Blue is just an amazing color for this. And I used this Holdra Blue from Scale 75 because it's really, really powerful for the shadows. So I just mix a little bit of that together to start. And then for the highlights, I recommend using something like Pastel Yellow or Sunny Skin Tone. That makes it a little more greenish instead of just adding white. And you can start by running this into the recesses as a fairly thin wash. But later on, when you want to be more direct and precise, you can use some thicker paint, normally as you get to the brighter colors, to do more precise dots, little drips, and yeah, just have fun with it. I really, really enjoy the colors uh, that you can do with Verdigris, but it's just a really fun effect. And if you've got any bits of your non-metallic you don't like, you could probably cover up some of them. I'm going to focus really on the recesses as if, you know, you cleaned it and you can't get it out of the recesses, but you can go pretty heavy on these effects. The last thing I did for this model was actually repaint the staff gold, but I want to put it in this section now as a kind of a recap and a bit more of a precise step by step on how you can do the gold with the new recipe. Uh, as opposed to when I was kind of working it out on the crown. So anyway, let's get into doing the gold from the beginning. So I base coated the whole thing Rhinox Hide, which is what I said I wish I started with. And then I give another base coat, but this time it's Rhinox Hide with a little bit of English uniform. And that just makes the shadows not quite so severe. And yeah, it just tints it towards that gold. Now we've got this nice brown undertone, we can start to build some very broad large highlights. And this is English uniform, still with the tiniest bit of Rhinox hide in. I want this to be a fairly dark gold overall, and that's why I'm going fairly gradually like this. So you can see I'm building up really, really big highlights and just leaving the darkest part on those undersides uh, where the angles change. And again, this is a really fun shape to play with non-metallic metal. After you build up the highlights to English uniform, you can start to add in some green brown. So here uh, I start to just go in a smaller space and build up the highlights with a touch of that green brown. And yeah, you need to just think about where the light's gonna hit, matching it up with the face. So all my light is coming in from the right hand side. And I just need to think about where the light can access basically. And eventually it's gonna be quicker and quicker as we go through each step because I'm only going to paint certain parts of this. So here I am at pure green brown, and what I can start to do to kind of blend it in is do a few little scratches and marks, and that's an easy way to transition things. And I want to avoid doing lots of glazing. I kind of just want to get a, a rough, scratched, worn out metal look. So doing little lines is a really nice way of blending it in, just like stippling really. Uh, rather than that really smooth, traditional kind of blended look. Now I slowly start to add in the sunny skin tone, and if you've got the highlights in the right place, your effect will start to work. I don't want a super shiny, super rich gold, so it's more important to get the highlight placement correct, uh, as opposed to having, yeah, like a really caramel looking gold. So here you can see I'm working in lots of little marks to build texture, 
at the same time as building the light towards that one corner. Here you can see it's almost done and I think it's looking pretty good at this point. I just add a tiny bit of ivory to that previous mix just for a final highlight on the corner, which wasn't really necessary. You don't need to go crazy over the top because not all non-metallic is shiny, uh, but I think we've built quite an intense light on the rest of the model, so we need to kind of match that with the metal. But yeah, I really enjoyed starting this from scratch and it just went way better rather than spending loads of time uh, fiddling and trying to get it right. So hopefully this makes sense. Uh, here you can see me adding some of that verdigris like we did before, just doing lots of little dots. And there's lots of indentations in this sculpt. So I did that to break these up. And yeah, it's really nice having this dull kind of antique old looking gold uh, with a little bit of verdigris and all those dots and imperfections. So yeah, in the end, once I got it right, super fun to paint this part. At this point, I decided to blitz a lot of the less significant details. And this, I don't want to talk about for too long. I just want to give you a quick recipe, uh, go over quickly, because I think you can make your own decisions and, and work these out. And then we'll just spend some time on the feathers. But really, the core of this tutorial was the skin and the non-metallic metal. But... Let's get the other details to look great as well. So this cloth I painted mega simple and this was just Barracknar Burgundy, a really dark purple. And I just highlighted this with a teeny tiny bit of some medium gray. So basically nothing exciting at all. I just wanted a little bit of a highlight on here and you can't see it too well. It is dropped into the shadow. So I basically didn't want it to draw any attention and it shouldn't get very many bright highlights because the light can't really get in there. So yeah, it's more about picking the right color. And personally, I love the triad of red, purple, turquoise and orange. So yeah, it was an easy one for me to choose. There's some bottles which I did with black green from Vallejo. I want them to be like a, a glassy effect. Again, they're glassy, but they're not really in the light, so I don't want them to be too shiny. And all I did was build up a quite wide, soft highlight, adding in some white. And I used white instead of a green because I don't want the highlights to be saturated. I want to have a, a greyish highlight as if white light's hitting it and the green isn't going to get too powerful. And these were quite fun to paint. I just gradually added in some white. And again, I used the kind of scratchy line way of building up the layers because that meant I didn't need to do many glazings or anything like that later. Uh, and it kind of looked like a scratched old bottle because I imagine he wouldn't have his bottles in perfect nick. It's nice painting small details like this because each one might take you half hour and it kind of feels like you achieved something. The non-metallic and the orange took me a long time. So it was cool to just quickly tick off a bunch of the stuff I had to do before going into the feathers, which I knew would probably be a bit of a slog. The beads, I couldn't decide what to do, so I went for a turquoise stone kind of colour, and I just used some dark sea blue mixed with the Caribbean blue. So the same blue as the verdigris, but the dark sea blue desaturated quite a lot, so it's not super bright. And then I just put some specular kind of shiny dot highlights only on the beads that kind of came into the light. So there's only a few that you can see from the main view. So I just made sure I highlighted just these ones. All the little straps and wraps and things, I just did some fairly standard recipes, mainly goby brown mixed with some birch or kind of any pale color really. It's not that important with these details. The wood I did with burnt umber and I just highlighted that up with a little bit of sunny skin tone. Trying to get some wood grain in there, but also match the highlights again with everything else. It's mostly about, you know, picking some nice colors that suit the material and just making sure the light matches up. But yeah, I kind of tended to riff with just some burnt umbers, yeah, goby brown, just those browns I've got. And I'm sure you've got go-to browns, just use those. These details aren't so important. They're important that they look good, of course, so paint them well, but what I mean is the recipe or the particular brown, I'm not gonna push you on that. 
And let's do one more detail in this video, which is gonna be the feather headdress. Now, I'm not convinced I did the perfect color combo, but really the most important thing I think is to tell you to treat the feathers as one big general shape before you go ahead and do all the details and the kind of striations on them. I think people just focus on doing lots of little lines on feathers and forget about the overall effect. So I did a base coat with olive brown from Vallejo and here I'm shading all the ones that kind of face down, especially on the shadow side with some Burnt Umber, the Scale Artist one. And this already you can see is effective because I'm bringing the light into the middle uh, and that just looks cooler, makes more sense and it has to match everything we're doing. So yeah, this was really cool. I enjoyed this and Again, the olive brown is really nice to work with and Burnt Umber from Scale Artist range is just so deep and versatile. It's one of those browns I've used probably on every model since uh, I discovered it. The idea for my color scheme was to have a, a cool brown matching the warmer browns of kind of the orange skin. And then I wanted to go into a little bit of a green tone and that kind of matches the verdigris but shifting it towards a more emerald as opposed to the blue. So I started to mix in some of Cyberite Green from Citadel uh, with the previous browns that I've used. So here it's dark brown and it does make a very gray color because we're mixing two paints that are already not very pure at all. So yeah, adding them together does make a fairly uh, grayish color, but I think that's fine because I don't want them to be really vibrant. And I just start to highlight the ones in the middle and any of the darker shadow ones, I kind of just hit the edge up as if the light can only access the edge where the feather is facing down. Now, it's up to you whether you paint all the individual feather striations, but I really don't think you have to. It's one of those things, and I talked about it very briefly in the first part of this, that there's definitely a painting kind of meta where it feels like this pressure that every feather has to have uh, lots of little strands painted on it but when I look at some references it's really more about the general light and the colors so it's up to you it's down to your taste but for me I would prioritize just having nice color lots of light and it's shifting between you know each feather instead of every feather having lots of detail on every strand took me a long time because, well, there's a lot of feathers and I did a mix of soft big highlights covering the entire feather and then for the really bright highlights, I did pick out some of those individual strands. So you kind of work in general, first of all, with some light and then you can pick out the detail later on. I think maybe the mistake is people detail too quickly on this stuff, but I really like the look of that dead central feather. Uh, with one side of it being that soft green light. I wasn't sure during painting this, but yeah, I think it worked out pretty cool. And here I'm adding some sunny skin tone, which shifts again to a kind of orange light, and that's just to match everything else. Uh, so yeah, it's a bit of a wild combo, going from a brown into a kind of emerald green with a little bit of orange. And yeah, I'm not convinced it's 100% perfect, but in the hand and I think in the photos, it does look pretty cool. Uh, I must admit I was feeling the time pressure on this one because it's commission with a deadline and yeah, I was trying to work fairly fast. So I kind of came up with this and was like, eh, I'm not sure, but I needed to kind of plow on. Otherwise, I'd never get this done. But I did this orc in just over a week and probably I'd spend a couple months on a 75mm orc normally, but it is possible. I think that's enough for this video. They're fairly chunky, these videos. We normally do much longer videos, you know, similar to this on the Patreon and on the YouTube stuff. We tend to keep it a little quicker, more of the army painting stuff, but I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, I'm certainly loving painting the model and it's been quite a challenge to paint at this pace, but I think the result for the time is really cool. Uh, next time, I'm going to go over the fur and the skulls because we kind of miss those, but I just didn't have time to quite finish them. I was pushing myself, but I didn't want to rush. But in the final part, I think we'll finish those skulls, the fur, and then we'll get the owl and the 
basing done. But anyway, I hope you really enjoyed it. Like I said, the main thing is the orange skin. And I think you could change the uh, the process for painting the skin with any colour. But I hope that it was good for you just to watch how to approach a large scale orc like this. But it is a lot of fun. And it's nice to paint skin and practice a lot of the challenges in skin. Such as the lighting and uh, getting all the shading right. Without having to worry about doing a realistic skin tone so doing a bright orange really really fun the non-metallics as well it was interesting for me just going hey starting from a brown base coat works for you i don't need to do you know anything starting with a, a lighter base coat so that was kind of cool please let me know what you think of this paint job and anything cool that you picked up in the video in the comments i always like to read those and yeah i hope you're enjoying this series overall again if you really enjoy what Cult of Paint are doing, please check out our Patreon where we've got tons of tutorials uh, longer than this and we really like to deep dive into all those details on the Patreon. And yeah, looking forward to the final part, I hope, where I get this miniature finished, glued on the owl and based just in time for the Monte San Savino show. Well, I've said it out loud now, so yeah, I'm going to need to motor in this final week. Anyway, thanks to Squidmart for commissioning us to paint this miniature, and I'm really excited to uh, send it to him, and I hope he likes it. Right, that's enough rambling. See you next time.